Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl, and coming up on Get Used to It, we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with United States Congress member Tammy Baldwin. Don't go away. I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to Get Used To It. Uh, today we have a special treat for you. Uh, if you watch the show, you know that occasionally we do a series we call Voices of Our Lives, uh, where we talk to a particularly wonderful individual from our community, someone who has ascended to great fame and glory through their own talent and courage. Uh, and today's guest is no exception. Uh, we're really happy to have Congress member Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin. Uh, many of you probably know that uh, Tammy served in the Wisconsin State Assembly for six years, and in November 98, she was elected to the Congress. Uh, she's the first open gay or lesbian non-incumbent ever uh, elected to that august, uh, some would say maybe not so august, body. But welcome, Tammy. Well, it's delightful to be here. Really glad that you could be with us and uh, kind of catch you on the fly while you're in Los Angeles. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, our viewers uh, in these sort of one-on-one -on -one interviews are often, I think, very interested to know kind of where people came from, uh, their family, where they grew up. Uh, so who, um, who raised you? Tell us a little bit about your family, about where you grew up, and then uh, I'll ask uh, more questions as we go along. I was born and raised in the district that I now represent. Madison, Wisconsin is my home. And um, born to uh, my mother when she was 19 years old and an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Sh shortly thereafter, she moved back in with her parents, my grandparents, and um, was raised in this wonderful sort of intergenerational uh, household where I um, had a lot of uh, input from uh, from two generations of people and it, it was a, a wonderful experience. We had a lot of um, affiliation with the university community. My grandfather was a professor, my grandmother was on the staff and as I mentioned my mother was a student and I got to see through all of their eyes uh, the impact that institution had on our community. Uh, but Madison is a wonderful place to grow up. It had some attributes of a bigger city um, probably because of the state capital and because of the university, even though it was a fairly moderate-sized city as, as they go. So uh, what kind of support did you get as a child? I mean, you, you seem to be a very confident person, and certainly um, you're actually pretty young to be in the Congress, and often that kind of confidence uh, reflects a kind of support or encouragement uh, as a child. What was it like for you growing up? There's several things that I can look back at and sort of see where um, strengths or characteristics of members of my family were um, passed along, let's say. Um, in, in one respect, I remember a really strong work ethic in the family. And um, my, my grandfather was a scientist at the university and was in this tireless pursuit of the truth through his experiments and through his publishing and defense of his, um, of his work. And so I watched this man just um, in many ways, almost obsessed with this search for scientific truths, um, secrets that would unlock information that would help solve disease, uh, diseases and uh, help us understand how the human body worked for um, what, whatever good that could produce. My grandmother was much more of a, a creative soul. Her job at the university was the head costume designer at the university theater. She brought me behind stage and um, showed me, you know, how to you know, take a, a bolt of fabric and turn it into a, an Elizabethan costume, or um, how to uh, go from the drawing board to a suit of armor. And you know, it was a magical experience for a young child. Um, my mother, um, in perhaps because she was so young and divorced when I was just a, a couple months old. Um, 
I, I got to really watch her come of age in many ways as a child, which is something that m many children don't get to experience. Um, she struggled with being so young and having a young daughter and being recently divorced. And um, I think as a very uh, young child, I did a lot of negotiating between her and her grandparents, which gave me these tremendous skills for being in a legislative <laughs> body where you're always negotiating between um, uh, various folks with, uh -huh. with different different issues. And, and I would say that those three predominant characteristics really stuck with me as I, as I grew up and, and started applying those skills outside of a family context. Uh, you've talked about your mom in terms of her activism, and I, I don't know if that was while she was at the university or, or later. Um, tell us a little more about her. She taught me the politics of the streets. And my grandparents were much more traditional in their approach to politics. They would, if they had a concern, they would write to their congressperson. <laughs> my mother, as many in her generation, took to the streets and said, you know, there's something going wrong here and we have to speak out, we have to do something about it. And so as a young child, one of my earliest memories of my mother's activism was um, actually being at a bus station with my grandparents and sort of waving to her as she and a number of friends from the university boarded a bus headed down to Mississippi and they were participating in a civil rights march against racial segregation policies. Um, as I was a little bit older, uh, they became real involved in the anti-war movement. And I, I remember uh, being in a car with my mother once and, you know, at every major corner on the university campus there would be people sitting with picket signs and literature you could pick up and read more, what can you do? And she said, you know, do this for the guys um, <laughs> with the picket signs. And so as a little kid, you know, uh, like a little flower child, I was learning the peace sign. and. Um, and, and I saw her participate in, in demonstrations on campus. Um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison was one of the campuses that really had a, um, a strong and loud voice in, in um, marking its dissent with um, the policy to be involved in the Vietnam War. Uh, a little bit later on, and, and by then I was approaching my teen years, I, my mother began to be more involved in the feminist movement. And, as I was remarking last night, back when they called it women's lib, before they um, ever had, um, you know, they were still in consciousness raising sessions. And it was really interesting for me to then later learn about that period of time as an adult and then recollect my mother participating in it and her eyes opening up to um, many of the double standards and inequities that she had endured in, in her life. Um, but yes, she taught me the, the activist politics, and I, I remember um, her bringing me as a, oh, I must have been nine or so years old, to the rock musical Hair on its first tour, and, and I loved it, and I learned all the words, and I, I think of how horrifying that must be to a parent to have their 10-year-old <laughs> singing, as you could think about all the words of that musical, uh, a little bit. Um, distressing, probably to, more to my grandparents than my mother. <laughs> but, um, but it, for me, captured through music the passion of that generation. And I remember really searching as I approached adulthood for um, the chance to participate in something as meaningful as I saw their efforts on, a multi um, on multiple issues. Does it give you a kind of politic, though? I mean. Uh a lot of children, it can kind of go either way. They, they tend to reject their parents' politics, whether they're uh, conservative or uh, progressive or radical. Uh, and then sometime around in your 30s, you look at yourself and you say, oh, there's an awful lot of my parents in me and their beliefs or what they uh, gave to me. Uh, what do you think you took away from your mother's activism? I don't think I ever rebelled against it, but I think given the examples that were offered to me as a youngster, um, my grandparents' model of political participation and my mother's, what I tried to do is combine them all and to realize that you can be effective sometimes in the very traditional model and, um, and other times the issue or the circumstances call for a different type of activism, a different type of involvement. And so when I tackle an issue today or, you know, in the past decade, I've sort of 
felt like I've been given all these different tools and all these different ideas and sometimes my instinct may be to say well our, our real task right now is public education and so we should be doing the more media oriented visibility work and rallies might be exactly what we need to do right now or um, really we need to get the legislators hearing from people so letter writing campaigns is what we need to to organize right now and and so I feel like watching the strength of all these various ways of communicating um, and and creating change helped inform uh, my politics and my approaches to politics now. But often there's a through line really in the way people view uh, what they do or how they go about it. I mean there, there's certainly a range of of politics and often that relates to how you think things should get done. For instance, uh, uh, millions of people in this country are, don't have medical insurance and uh, many of us think that the, the government needs to take a responsibility for that. I mean a lot of what I guess we call the, the democratic ethic. Um, and I know that you have had a, a passion for social justice through your life. Uh, do you find that that really informs your work? Okay. Absolutely, and in fact, that that issue um, specifically was the cornerstone of of my political career. I I believe that, you know, in many ways, our society has um, confirmed its belief and support in, for example, public education for all. But we haven't. The people have not yet insisted that their government say we need health care for all. And and then when you talk about the strategy to get there, and especially as we sit here at a time when there's over 43 million people in this country without insurance, what I think of as, as the, the foundation that needs to be laid to finally get that passed is to give a voice to those 43 million people. And so again, I go back to my mother's uh, more, po uh, more, more or less her approach to politics because it, I have just no question in my mind that if 43 million people could speak at once we could do it in a week, you know, <laughs> that, that that would be such a tidal wave that no one could ignore it. And so the question then is you know, how do we engage um, more and more people into bringing their government around because that, that's truly the way it should work. So did you go to the same uh, university in Madison your grandfather was at and your grandmother was at and your mother went to? Did you go to the same school? For law school I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison but actually um, my grandfather was born in New York, my grandmother was born in England, my mother was born in New York City also um, before they all relocated to Wisconsin and so um, I didn't follow, I couldn't follow all of their educational paths. The one escape I ever had from Wisconsin just because after um, you know, growing up there I wanted to get a taste of another part of the country. Um, I, I did my undergraduate work at Smith College in oh. Northampton, Massachusetts and um, I had one s semester in summer during those years where I studied in Washington DC uh, as I was completing my political science or government major and, um, and then returned and actually doing it that way was I think very helpful because I feel like I live in Wisconsin and I live in Madison by choice not because I was born there and just never got around to leaving and uh, I very definitely chose to come home after my college years. What was college like at Smith? Oh it was it was a perfect choice for me I, I didn't know it when I was choosing it in fact it was my rebellion um, I, I had wanted to go to Harvard and I didn't get in and and so it was the fallback and uh, I had qualms about going to an all-women's school um, and yet for reasons of learning, just enhancing my self-esteem and my belief that I could do anything, going to that institution was wonderful. I mean all of the student leadership positions were occupied by young women. All of the um, the scholarships, the awards, the opportunities. Um, you, every role model you saw uh, among the students were um, positions that women held and you just developed this belief that you could do anything, you could aspire to anything. That um, The 
faculty, I had a double major in political science or government and mathematics. Had I been at any other university, 1% of my faculty in the math department would have been female if, you know, by national standards. At Smith, it was almost 50-50. And there I saw these brilliant mathematicians who were women. And so at a time, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, where um, it's so easy to, I think, be intimidated from asserting yourself and, and um, aspiring to be anything, I, I got all the support in the world. And it was a wonderful institution for me. So Tammy, last night when you were talking to the crowd, you uh, mentioned that you had come out in your junior year at college. So now we know that you were at Smith and you were having a wonderful time and faculty is women and it's a really good place for you. But um, something must have happened to trigger this. I mean, what happened in your life and uh, how did this all come about and how did you feel about it? You know, it, it was really interesting. It, there, there's a longer story, but in many ways it happened very suddenly for me, sort of like you know, a hammer hitting me on the head going, oh my God, this explains a whole lot of things. <laughs> but a lot of the, the longer part of the story was um, my beginning to ask myself questions after a, a dear friend of mine was struggling to come out to me and not necessarily feeling safe enough yet to tell me, but I had no question in my mind of what it was she was trying to tell me. And, and trying to understand what she was going through, I think, made me start to ask a lot of questions to myself. And it was a, a, just a very a powerful set of memories for me. Um, I, she struggled so hard. And in many ways, her struggles uh, to build trust, to figure out a way to safely come out to me made it so much more easier for me to do um, because she almost had done some of that painful stuff for me. Um, I feel like she gave me a great gift in, in that sense of being able to allow me to walk through that journey with her. But still it had to be, it had to be kind of a struggle for you to begin to tell people. It was. I, I think it's also very important for me to go back in time and remember those because I think oftentimes after we come out and we've come out not only to our friends and family but to <laughs> in the newspaper <laughs> on television and with headlines and all that we forget about that initial moment in which uh, you're disclosing to the first person or um, the first family member um, and it was terrifying in each case I was really lucky in the responses. I, I remember once being so nervous to tell one of my friends back in Madison as I had come out at Smith College and I was home for a break and I sat down with my friend Dana and she was so angry with me and it was, why didn't you tell me three months ago? I'm your best friend. It wasn't, I'm angry with the information you're telling me. And, you know, so what, how lucky I was. Um, my mother and my grandmother were both wonderful. My grandfather had passed away before, um, before I came out. Um, in their own unique ways, my mother had a large circle of friends who were gay or lesbian in Madison. And after I graduated from college and returned to Madison, when I finally worked up the nerve early on in that summer to tell her, um, Oh, she wanted to introduce me to all of her friends. <laughs> um, and, and while we weren't of the same generation, it was just so wonderful. She'd have her dinner party, and my mother would invite all of her gay and lesbian friends over. And, and um, yeah, she was re really hoping um, to do what she could to, to make it easier. Because when I returned to Madison, I really didn't know anyone in the community and had to search to find a community. I, I remember one of my favorite um, coming out stories at Smith um, is when I attended my first lesbian dance <laughs> and I was going um, with my with my girlfriend and I was walking towards the student union and you know scared to death of, of who would be there who would see me going there all of those things and I look and there's a bunch of protesters with picket signs marching in front of the student union and I'm like horrified 
the, the first time I ever go to a dance, I'm going to have to, you know, I don't know. what I didn't know what was going to happen. As I, as I approached, it was a group of protesters protesting the fact that the second floor of the student union wasn't accessible. <laughs> Dykes with disabilities were out there marching, saying, we want to be able to go to the dance also. And it was the name of their group, Protesting the College and its ability to accommodate people in wheelchairs and with other physical disabilities. And, you know, I can't, uh, um, you can imagine the sigh of relief I had. Went, like, oh, I, I should have a picket sign too. Um, but yeah, it is, it is important to sometimes go back and remember that each one of those steps was terrifying and then freeing. Terrifying and then freeing. I, I remember the first time I came out um, in a newspaper article right after, um, it was the first in-depth treatment of the issue after I was elected to the county board in, in 1986. And um, I didn't know how my life would change the day before the major newspaper in the area would print my picture and my quotes in the interview. And I was just terrified. And, and then all of the support that flowed from that article made me feel so much more free and every time it's that that uh, juxtaposition of terror than joy. So when you got back to Madison what kind of work did you do? I mean it sounds like you were engaged in or thinking about public policy or even electoral politics uh, right away but was there a particular area um, that you worked in before you uh, before you ran for office for the first time? I had um a great sort of warm-up to running for political office. I graduated from college and returned to Madison and got an internship that summer in the governor's office. Um, governor Anthony Earle was our last Democratic governor and he was working on advancing comparable worth pay equity legislation through the legislature and I got a chance to be a policy intern in his office on that issue. And this was cutting edge legislation. This was one of the first states to really go through and look at not just equal pay for equal work, but equal pay for comparable work. Because so what we were finding in those years is that, yeah, we had made a lot of progress when two people were working side by side in uh, having pay equity, but we had jobs that were dominated by female workers and jobs that were dominated by male workers that had similar levels of responsibility, consequence of error, supervisory responsibilities, etc. And um, the pay inequities were enormous. And so this landmark legislation was going through and I had a chance to work on that. It was sort of my, uh, my, my first sort of policy roll up the sleeves issue. And then I also had a real keen interest in electoral politics and started, thought, well, let's start with local races. And I contacted my alder person and said, I'd like to work on the city council races. And, you know, not many people just call out of the blue and say they want to volunteer. <laughs> so I was put in charge of somebody's campaign uh, without knowing a whole lot about what I was doing, but just getting in there and demystifying what electoral politics was all about. Um, you know, how do you communicate and uh, uh, how do you run a campaign? And then the, I think the, the, the best sort of demystification process for me was when I volunteered with the National Women's Political Caucus to monitor women's issues at the city council and county board level. And um, in, in, in doing so, I would attend the meetings. And you know, I think the Women's Political Caucus of Dane County just sort of said, here's this energetic woman, you will send her to some meetings and maybe she'll work out that energy. But I, I would watch these debates and say, I could do that. I'm as smart as anyone debating these issues. And it was one of the moments at which I could suddenly see myself in those roles. And so um, in, in the... Uh, in the fall of 85, I enrolled in law school, and um, my uh, county board supervisor decided to retire, and I thought, well, you know, why don't we do it all at once? First year law student, run for county board, and, and I did in my campus district, and that's the first office I sought or, or held. But it's interesting that you would go into uh, electoral politics. I mean, you're, here's your grandfather, who's an academic, uh, your grandmother, who's an artist in, in an academic setting, uh, your mother, who's an activist and probably 
not all that trusting of electoral politics. Um, what is it that drew you to uh, this, this, uh, the democratic process for getting things done? Well, I guess in part through my internships and my issue interests. I was very interested in health, I was very interested in, in poverty issues, and I felt in order to make an impact, that that's where um, the resources were, that's where uh, the programs were being set up and administered, especially at the county level, which in our county uh, ran all the child welfare programs, the um, poverty programs. Um, and we were struggling with a lot of issues and I just felt that that's where I could make a, a better difference, um, a, a bigger difference. And um, I didn't think that enough people who shared my perspective were sitting in the room. <laughs> So did it make any difference that you were a lesbian? I mean, here, here's the headlines in the newspaper, but everybody's very supportive. Uh, had there ever been an open gay or lesbian supervisor before? Yes, and in fact, I'm so grateful because it, it partly because somebody else had um, shattered those glass ceilings, it, it allowed me to confront the challenges that I needed to to come out in such a visible way and to be the first in other uh, venues later on. Um, there were two openly gay members of the county board when I was elected to the county board in 1986. Wow. And um, Dick Wagner and Kathleen Nichols had been out for about um, two or three years. And you know, I didn't have much of an excuse if I wanted to stay in the closet. <laughs> they, obviously it hadn't hurt them electorally. and. Um, Oh, they were there to support me, uh, there to help me um, in any way possible. They also opened up another incredible door, which was this, um, I know you're very familiar with the organization from participating it, in it, is this network of openly gay and lesbian elected and appointed officials across the country, which became such a, a, an important support group for me. When I was first elected in 1986 and attended my first such conference, there were 14 openly gay and lesbian elected officials sitting around this table. We were, there were a few people who couldn't make it to the conference, but we represented almost all the openly gay and lesbian elected officials in the world. Um, we, at the table it included um, Chris Smith, who was a member of parliament in, in England. And, um, and it was just amazing, but we, we shared, we offered advice and counsel and support to one another. And, um, I, it would have been much harder for me without those folks. And they all gave me the, the confidence I needed several years later to think about taking a next step where I wasn't going to have as much company. Talk about that next step. Well, um, I, I had been on the county board for um, six years when um, my state assembly person decided to run for Congress. And he um, was a wonderful role model, had always been supportive of me in, in local office. He, by the way, his name is David Clarenbach, was, he was responsible for passing in Wisconsin the nation's first bill protecting um, sexual orientation as a protected class, um, passing a civil rights law in 1982. Wow. It was seven years before the next state was able to pass such, uh, such a bill. And, um, and, and so he had really been a, a pioneer in, in many respects. He has a political legacy that's much broader than that. But in any event, he was running for Congress. And I remember about a year and a half out him taking me aside and said, I'd really like you to think about running for my seat. It was one of those moments that you you sort of sit there in disbelief and say, I can't believe David Clarenbach is, is encouraging me to run for his seat. Um, but it gave me some forewarning. It gave me a chance to really think through um, whether I wanted to, what sort of impact I could make. And it became very clear to me that I could, could have um, a real impact in the state legislature and uh, had a, a real tough primary. It's a pretty democratic seat, so the, the, the uh, more significant race was in the 
Democratic primary. Um, but again, it had a wonderful coalition of supporters who, in my race, saw, um, well, they experienced with me all those people saying, well, it's probably going to be tough for you to win this. You know, you're an out lesbian, there hasn't been a woman in this seat, uh, you're awfully progressive, all of the things I heard again in the congressional race, a little young for this. Um, and so many people related to that um, experience of being cautioned against something and, and not being seen as credible for irrelevant factors. And, and that sort of group of people began working together to get me elected. People who've been told, you can't do this because. Exactly, exactly. Don't try that. The voters just aren't quite ready. And, and I mused to myself that the, these naysayers are not necessarily the opposition. They're often our friends, supposedly, saying, well, you know, this is a really key seat and we can't afford to lose it. And, um, you know, we need the perfect candidate. Let's say the candidate from Central Casting. I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your campaign like when you first ran for the State Assembly? Oh, it was um, very, very spirited, I'd say. Um, we were, and this is so similar to my congressional campaign, but focusing on organizing voters who historically had not shown up to the polls and that we absolutely couldn't win unless we could generate the energy and the excitement to get people out. It was very volunteer intensive, um, and it was very uh, focused on uh, gaining a strong youth vote, uh, registering people on campus, getting, getting them to vote um, early on in the semester. But did the newspapers insist on doing the same headline every time, lesbian running for assembly? Two things were interesting. Um, there were two headlines that happened. One, this was the year of the woman politics. This was 1992. And so I, would, I was the only woman in my primary, and I would always be asked, you know, how is it to run as a woman? And, um, you know, what, um, what is it like to, what would it be like to be the first openly gay or lesbian member of the Wisconsin legislature? You know, it's great. I mean, we have all these people supporting us, and we get wonderful uh, volunteers. But uh, sometimes running for a higher office, uh, don't you worry or didn't you worry that all of those people out there that you didn't really know, uh, who were reading this press and didn't really know you that much, uh, that, that somehow they were going to take this into account in a way that wouldn't help? Uh, weren't you anxious that maybe some of this would put the kibosh on your, uh, your race? Yeah, um, I, I knew very little about um, dealing with the press at that point because in our community, um, the county board is a very low profile office. It's very little uh, press coverage. We have huge county boards, 39 of us, huh. um, and each of us represented about 10,000 people. And so when I ran for state assembly, I, it was a real uh, new level of scrutiny. And when I started to see all the focus on um, the year of the woman in politics and uh, on my being the first uh, openly gay or lesbian candidate for uh, the state assembly and, and certainly would be the first uh, openly gay or lesbian member, I, I began to worry and, and didn't know what sort of impact it would have on, on voters and people deciding what they were going to do. And also, I'm um, very concerned that I would be viewed very narrowly as having only a narrow set of issues that I cared about. And despite the fact that I would try to turn a, an interview back to a focus on the things that had led me to politics in the first place, you know, health issues and, um, you know, community issues and uh, poverty issues, it was really frustrating to me at that point as I was sort of learning um, without a lot of people to show me how. Yeah, um, I met Elaine Noble once when I was um, going to law school at Harvard and she had just been elected uh, to the Massachusetts legislature and she told this story uh, about a woman in her district, an uh, uh, elderly Irish woman who came up to her on the street and you know, poked her really hard in the arm and said, now remember dearie, you're there for all of us. Uh, and I think the notion was that they wanted to remind her uh, that she was representing a district that had a lot of different kinds of people in it, and they didn't want to hear that she was just doing this one kind of issue. 
um, and I think it's the same for everybody. I mean, you're always a certain kind of person. Uh, Catholic might be elected, but uh, you'll have Jews in your district. You have to think about all of that. But people don't really know very much about gay people, and they seem to have this underlying fear that we're only going to concentrate, you know, on these gay issues when we generally represent a real broad scope of interests, just like anybody from any community. Uh, but you must have actually uh, sold that, I think, to your district, because you've been reelected quite a few times, as I recall. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, a couple of interesting things that happened. One thing that I began to discover was that my being out and the focus in the media about um, my being a lesbian challenged a couple of other myths that voters have about politicians. And that is a sort of cynicism about, um, you know, all, all politicians do is decide what the opinion polls say and that's what they decide to stand for because all they care about is being reelected. And so when somebody is out in office, it's viewed as, as being, you know, disclosing something that's against your electoral interest, against your political interest. And, and therefore, it, it sort of is a, a signature of integrity. And um, I loved telling the story of this sort of gruff, big old man who walked up to me one day and I really was nervous when I saw him approaching. He seemed you know, very determined, a little bit angry and gruff. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, if, you, if you're willing to be honest about that, <laughs> you'll probably be honest about anything and everything. And, you know, he basically made it really clear that that, that had won his vote. And I think it allows people who um, are out uh, in office and you know certainly all politicians who take principled stands that are viewed as being against their electoral interests sort of rise above the general cynicism that people have uh, about um, office holders but but back to your uh, your focus on um, you know the, the anxiety about can an out lesbian or an out gay man in office represent everyone um, you know that I, I think we, we demonstrate through our leadership and most of the people who have been successful in winning office as openly gay or lesbian candidates have been people with a very broad agenda who, um, as we often say, they're not the gay candidate, they're the candidate who happens to be gay. Um, in my case, in my congressional race, um, my, my major focus was on, on health care reform. And, uh, in fact, by that point, I had learned a lot more about dealing with the scrutiny that a campaign got to be much more successful in making sure that there were more balanced um, reporting on why it was I had a passion to uh, represent the people of, of South Central Wisconsin. But you know, sometimes there is a difference. I mean, sometimes as gay and lesbian electeds, um, it's usually us who bring the legislation to protect our community. To, uh, to protect us at work and to protect our kids. Uh, we're not the only ones. I mean, uh, st uh, straight legislators also bring these bills and I love them for it. But, but there's a certain authenticity to our voice that has to be brought, I think, to this work. Um, and I guess I don't think of myself as a legislator who happens to be a lesbian because I I'm really called upon, and so is Carol Migdon in our assembly, to kind of be the lesbians, you know, the gay people with the authentic voice. And uh, I, I don't know whether you've experienced this in your work uh, as well. Do you find that sometimes in the course of your service you are called upon to play that role? Absolutely. Um, it, and I would say that it's very clear to me that I bring my life to work with me. I bring my life experiences to work with me. And the challenge when we serve in legislative bodies that are not as diverse as our nation is, um, it, is that we end up um, being the voice for um, many people who don't have a seat in or a voice in these legislative bodies. I, I bring my experience as a woman to work with me every day. I work in an institution that's about you know, 86 percent male and I bring my experience in life as a lesbian to work with me every day in a body that's 99 percent heterosexual. Uh, it, it's absolutely vital that I 
use that voice and and talk about my life experience and use the power that I have with the position to both stop harmful things as well as advance things that uh, advance a, a civil rights agenda for gay and lesbian people. So here you are safely ensconced in this wonderful uh, Wisconsin Assembly. How is it then you come to decide to run for Congress? I mean, it seems to me like a really big step. It was a wonderful set of, of um, opportunities uh, to explore. Very similar to my experience with the State Assembly, I had someone take me aside, somebody who I uh, looked up to, to tell me to think about doing it. It was uh, Paul Soglin, who at the time was the mayor of Madison and had made a run for uh, the congressional seat in 1996 against an, the then incumbent, um, Scott Klug. And this was before his campaign was over. He took me aside and he said, one of two things is going to happen. I'm um, either going to win, in which case I don't plan on staying in Congress for a long, long time, and I want you to think about succeeding me, or I may lose, in which case I want you to think about running. And it was another one of those moments where you feel humbled by somebody thinking of you and thinking that, um, that I would be the, the person to do it. Um, I think that the other part of the thought process always for me in looking at advancing in politics is where or whether I would have a, a bigger impact by running for higher office. I actually miss the closeness to the constituency mm -hmm. that I had as a county board member. I knew my neighborhood that I represented. I knew a good percentage of the 10,000 people I represented. I knew the issues really, really well. And yet, I would go to the body um, that, where they sent me and find that they didn't have the resources or the power to solve all the problems that I knew so intimately at that local level of government. Mm -hmm. And it's a trade-off, but um, there are um, other opportunities that are obviously opened up um, at the congressional level and I ultimately decided that that is where I could have the the greater impact. What's it been like for you in Congress? Oh it's been it's been wonderful. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I say I feel like I'm still in my honeymoon period. Um, everyone's been uh, you know very welcoming and even the people that you would be most surprised to find out are being respectful and dignified are still being um, very kind. Uh, if I were to describe how um, how the first few months have been, in fact I remember going home after about three months in Congress for a break that we had and giving a series of speeches and, and I sort of said the headline on my first few months is joy terror, stress. <laughs> and, and joy is about, you know, walking into the U.S. Capitol for the first time, about to be sworn in. Um, I was able to bring, you can bring children up to the age of 12 onto the floor uh, by rule of the house. And so I was able to bring a young girl named Katie to witness my swearing in. She and um, her moms had worked on my campaign tirelessly throughout the summer before. I mean, she had, she had dropped leaflets in her neighborhood and knocked on doors and done everything that everyone else had done. And so she'd seen this from beginning to end. And, and it was so wonderful to have this young girl who got to witness that and then sort of looked at me and said, I could see in here someday and and you know it it, it was just wonderful um, it, terror <laughs> terror is is uh, doing things for the first time for example walking into the um, Judiciary Committee for the first time uh, I, I watched a little bit of the impeachment I know that that room was filled with tension and partisan rancor and here I was, a freshman member on that committee, wondering how I'd be received. And 
other things that you do for the very first time that you have no idea what, what it's going to be like. Uh, my first floor speech, I, uh, I typically still get a little nervous when I speak in front of uh, crowds. But what I've never experienced before is trying to give an impassioned speech in a chamber that's almost empty. <laughs> and um, if, if you watch C-SPAN, you know sometimes that depending on the time of day when you get your chance to make your remarks, that room can be completely empty. And I came marching onto the floor to give my speech. Uh, you know, the gentle lady from Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes on the patient's bill of rights and there's four or five people in the room and they're not even paying attention because they're preparing for their speech making and you sort of spend the next five minutes trying to develop an intimate relationship with the C-SPAN camera. <laughs> 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 um, and, and then the, the, the stressful aspects of the job, uh, you know, I, I approach this sort of lightheartedly, but um, trying to establish two homes, trying to get used to a, a, a new schedule with your time at 15-minute uh, increments, um, oftentimes two things at every 15-minute increment, and, um, and learning the names and the faces and, you know, the issues and the home states of 434 new colleagues. Um, the, the part I love about the stress, though, is that it is through the pressure and the tension and the stress that you determine what's really important and that you have to make those decisions. Well, you got a whole lot of press when you were invited to, to speak to the press, I guess, at the, the National Press Club. Um, and I'm not sure that everybody actually saw the approach that you took, which um, everybody was very pleased about, I think, reading about it. Would you tell a little bit about that? Because apparently you just charmed the pants off of everybody. Well, it was great. I remember um, finding out that we had gotten the offer to participate in this, um, I guess, biennial event. At the beginning of every session of Congress, the Washington Press Club Foundation holds a charitable ball for raising money for scholarships where the featured speakers are four freshman members, uh, one Democrat, one Republican from each house. And we are invited to give humorous remarks. Now, I don't do stand-up. <laughs> I'm almost very, I mean, I'm intimidated of the idea of, of presenting jokes and presenting humor. But we sort of analyzed this and said, you know, this is a real opportunity to bomb or to succeed. And, and we knew and, and as it ended up being the case, you know, and there there's about 1,200 people. There's the New York Times table, the CNN table, there's the speaker's table and the majority leader's table and all of these uh, amazing figures to listen to us. And um, we played with it. We sort of uh, came up there and I said, I think I know why you've asked me to speak here tonight because I'm a member of a group that has been um, historically discriminated against, has been the subject of um, harassment at the workplace, um, the subject of, of, of base humor. Of course, I'm talking about blondes, especially blondes named Tammy. And you know, everyone in the room is getting more and more nervous, like, she's not going there, is she? She's really not going to bring that up. But then we just played with it for a long time. and. Um, Frankly, I, I recall later on having several quite conservative members of Congress coming up and reading lines back to me, um, and recalling some of the blonde jokes that we were making, and how how wonderful to to have a sort of introduction um, to many of the people uh, who I'm going to serve with. So it was a great opportunity, and and uh, we had fun with it. And you have a partner now? Yes, Lauren. How long have you been together? Four years. It must have been pretty stressful for her. I mean, you were talking about having, you know, the two homes, and how has that all worked out? Well, it's interesting. One thing that is good is that as we were, um, as we were dating, as we were getting together, she knew that this was a distinct possibility, and so um, fortunately, no surprises. But oh, it's been an incredible challenge. Um, you have to really, really focus on family to. Um, you know, to be able to endure a, a hectic campaign and now the, um, the commute back and forth. She, uh, because of her own career, has chosen for at least the time being to, to remain in Wisconsin. Mm. She's a, an attorney. 
um, advancing in her firm, hopefully will uh, achieve a partnership at some point, and, um, and really um, is devoted to her, uh, her career. And so I do make a habit to try to get home every weekend. Um, if possible, you know, I'm there four days and in Washington three days. It doesn't always work out that well, um, especially as our workload in D.C. gets higher. And um, she's made a commitment to try uh, periodically to take a few days off and, and come and visit during the week in, in Washington. And, and does she get her spouse pin? She does. <laughs> um, the, every member of Congress gets issued a congressional sort of lapel pin to identify us. And we all get issued a spouse pin. And it was a thrill when I was able to pin her um, sort of uh, on, on the day of swearing in. And uh, a, a friend recalls to me that that was one of the most moving images that she saw um, of, of all of this sort of history making um, uh, adventure that we've been on. And she went home and told her partner, I, I, I saw Tammy pin, pin the spouse pin on, and it was very moving. Tammy, thanks so much for making this happen. I know you had to really go out of your way and kind of stop by on your way to the airport, and we're very, very appreciative that you took the time to do this. Oh, well, this has been a joy for me, too. And we're glad you took the time to join us, too. And uh, maybe as you look at your United States Congress, the House of Representatives, and maybe even the United States Senate, or look at our gay and lesbian members, might have to just say to America, get used to it. We uh, taped this show on Father's Day, and uh, our director, Jesse Lawson, and our producer, Terry House, and I uh, all lost our dads a fairly recent time ago. So we wanted to dedicate this show to them, to Jesse Lawson Sr., to Marvin House, and to Arthur Kuehl.